The transistor is a very powerful tool in practically all modern electronics. Today it is not only used in low power applications like microcontrollers, but also for instance in power electronics where large currents up to some 100 amps have to be switched. But when the transistor was discovered in 1947 around Christmas Eve, all the engineers of Bell Lab could think of was to amplify a current. And that's what we're going to look into. For this video you will need some basic knowledge about a single bipolar transistor as well as some basic knowledge about passive circuits. If you need further explanation during the video you can find additional information in the video description. Feel free to pause anytime you want and have a look at it. Today there is a big variety of transistors available on the market. To simplify our deliberation of transistor amplifiers we will focus on a rather simple to explain bipolar transistor, like this three-legged guy I hold in my hands. A transistor has three terminals, called emitter, collector and base. There are two kinds of bipolar transistors, NPN and PNP. You can find a detailed explanation of the physics behind them in the links below, but for now we want to concentrate at these highly simplified diode circuits for a basic understanding of their functionality. More precisely, we will focus on the NPN transistor. Notice that the arrow in the circuit symbol resembles the polarity of the diodes. That implies that for the PNP transistor all polarities of the applied voltages have to be reversed. To amplify a signal with the NPN transistor we have to observe some basic rules. The first rule is that the collector must be more positive than the emitter. Secondly, we assume that the voltages between base and emitter to be at least 0.6 volt to ensure that the base emitter diode is conducting. If we build a circuit to operate the transistor in this configuration, we can observe that a small current applied to the base leads to a large current between the collector and the emitter. If we now manipulate the base current in a certain range, the other current will change proportionally, but with much higher amplitude. An amplifier is born, which, much like a bullhorn, can transform a small input signal into a large output signal. Notice that the transistor does not actively amplify the current by itself, but solely controls a current that is provided by a power source. You can imagine the transistor as a valve of a pipeline. The base current simply acts as the handle of the valve, which controls the flow through the pipeline. As the base emitter voltage rises, nothing happens at first until the forward voltage drop of the base emitter diode is reached. At this point the valve opens and a large current can flow. When the base voltage is decreased below the bias voltage of approximately 0.6 volts, the current flow will stop. Now that we know the basic principle of a transistor, it's time to experiment. It is important to understand that the transistor amplifies current only. This way of thinking might feel a little unusual at first. To get a better understanding of what's going on, we consider a rather simple circuit called the emitter follower. The transistor is supplied by two voltage sources. One at the base, which we further refer to as input voltage, and one at the collector, which we call supply voltage. The output voltage of the transistor circuit is located at the emitter. The emitter voltage at the base leads to an input current called IB, which, as we already know, causes a proportional current at the output called IC. As long as we stick to our rules, a varying input current will lead to a higher but proportional output current. The factor by which the current increases is called the current gain beta. 
We can add this phenomenon to the rules and state that IC is beta times IB. The emitter current IE is then simply the sum of the collector and the base current. The thing about beta is that it's not a reliable value. It varies a lot with individual transistors, even of the same kind. It varies with temperature and with different levels of collector current. For simplicity and as a rule of thumb, we just estimate it and say it's a hundred. We don't need to know the real value as long as we underestimate it. So a hundred is fine. To get the output voltage, we just need to remember the simplified diode circuit. The output voltage is always one diode voltage drop less than the voltage at the base. So let's say 1.6 volts at the input gets us about 1 volt at the output. If we now vary the input voltage by a few millivolts, the output will simply follow, but 1.6 to 1.7 volts less positive. Hence the name follower. At first glance, that doesn't seem like an impressive circuit, until you realize two things. One, the output current IC is basically independent of our supply voltage, as long as we remember to obey our two rules. And two, a small change of the input voltage implies a small change of the input current, which causes a big change of the output current. One could also say that the input impedance looking into the base is much larger than the output impedance looking into the emitter. This is great, because in electronics you're usually plugging the output of something into the input of something else. As a general rule of thumb, if you don't want to degrade your signal, you have to make sure that the output resistance is at least 10 times lower than the input resistance of the following circuit which is exactly what the emitter follower does. It even does better, since the output impedance is about beta times smaller than the input impedance. Remember that beta is approximately 100. This allows a weak input signal source to drive a load at the output of the follower, which it would not be able to drive by itself. Seems pretty useful, right? But if we want to amplify an AC coupled signal, like an audio signal, we have to make sure that we don't cut off the negative swing of the output signal. You might heard of this effect, it's called clipping, and it sounds like this. In order to avoid clipping, we simply add a DC offset to the input signal. This is called biasing and it is necessary for any transistor amplifier. Now we are going to have a closer look at an actual design example of a emitter's follower for audio signals. In general, the frequency of audio signals range between 20 and 20,000 Hz. A typical supply voltage for such a circuit would be 15 volts. We start with our basic circuit from before. First, we get rid of the additional source for the input voltage. Instead, we are only going to use one supply voltage and a simple voltage divider for biasing. Secondly, we add a capacitor at the input as a high pass filter to make sure that only AC signals with more than 20 Hz are amplified. Now we choose the output voltage for the largest possible symmetrical swing, which is half of the supply voltage or 7.5 volts. For simplicity, we want to have 1 milliamps flowing at the output, so we need a 7.5K resistor at the emitter. The voltage at the base will automatically be 0.6 volts higher than the one at the emitter, or 8.1 volts. Now what about the voltage divider? On the one hand, the divider must provide 8.1 volts at the base, so the ratio R1 to R2 must be 1 to 1.17. On the other hand, we want the input impedance to be large compared to the output impedance. We already know that the impedance looking into the base is approximately beta times the resistance at the emitter, or 750K, estimated with our first rule of thumb. 
According to the second rule of thumb, the output impedance of the DC bias source, in this case the impedance looking into the voltage divider, must be at least 10 times smaller than the input impedance looking into the base. This gives us a parallel resistance of about 75k for R1 and R2. With the ratio of 1 to 1.17 in mind, we get 139k for R1 and 163k for R2. Those exact resistor values are not commercially available, so we take comparable values which can be found in the E24 standard resistor series. This gives us 130k for R1 and 150k for R2. As a last step, we choose C1 to form a high pass filter for every AC signal with frequencies above 20 Hz. The input impedance we now have to deal with is the impedance looking from the input into the voltage divider. It is about 75k in parallel to the input impedance of the follower which is about 750k. This leaves us with a value of 68k to design the high pass filter with C1. We can now calculate the capacitor for a 3 dB cutoff frequency of 20 Hz. Again we want to choose a proper value in the E24 series and finally get the capacitor value of about 0.15 microfarads. This basic design example of an emitter follower should give you a first clue how transistor amplifiers work. The emitter follower can be used in a variety of different applications, like current sources, voltage regulators or in the output stage of class B or class AB amplifiers. You can find some example circuits in the description of the video. The emitter follower is most commonly used as impedance transformer. The low output impedance of the emitter follower allows driving high loads which might be too demanding for a signal source to drive on its own. Of course, there is a large variety of other amplifiers like the common emitter amplifier which can amplify voltages. We will discuss this and other useful transistor circuits in our next video. For further reference, we highly recommend the following two books. The Art of Electronics by Horowitz and Hill, which is very informative as well as entertaining. And for our German-speaking viewers, we recommend Elektronische Schaltungstechnik written by members of our institute. You can find the exact naming in the video description. So that's all for today. I'm Michael with the Institute of Electronics. I hope you have learned something today. But anyway, thanks for watching.